Back in 1932, my father, George Heather, moved here and uh, built a sawmill and also had to build a pier, uh, well, a wharf, to take the timber out so it could be loaded onto the, uh, the barges that took it off to Hobart and to Melbourne. The uh, Almadopal was the one that took it to uh, Melbourne and the May Queen and Enterprise that took it to Hobart. And that was you know, back in those days when uh, there was steam and crosscut saws and axes and draft horses and so forth. In 1940, George Heather moved the entire sawmill operation a few kilometres south to Cockle Creek. This is the furthest south any road goes in Australia. So this is the remains of the old jetty, is it, Jean? Yes, yes, this is where the approach was coming out along here. And because the approach was narrow, just uh, enough for a tram line to go out. And when it got out, it uh, fanned out and went into a big area where um, when we first came here was pretty obsolete. So Dad had to drive new piles in and restore it to a, a substantial area to put the timber on so that when the barges came in, they loaded it straight onto the barges. And when it was taken out, it was sorted out into it all its individual sizes and, and tallied and then you knew exactly how much was there. If the barge couldn't take the lot, you just deducted what was left on the wharf. So that went from here to Hobart on various barges, the uh, Enterprise and SMHT and uh, oh, I think the Lena. There was quite a few barges used to come in but that was taken straight through to Hobart. Yeah, this was the wharf area and uh, as you can see those bits of bull kelp out there, that's where they were under the wharf and we used to catch crayfish there. Did you really? <laughs> yes, you drop the pot down and leave it down, pick it at night and you'd have crayfish for the next day. <laughs> yeah, quite a few salmon used to come in round here too, because I suppose the boats used to throw their rubbish over and, and entice them in here. Yes. Well, when the barges came in, they bought the supplies from Hobart for the mill itself, which we had, oh, I think, about eight or nine draft horses, and uh, they had to have food, so there were chaff and oats and everything that we needed for those horses were bought and in on the barge. Also, the material for the uh, works of the mill itself, like gas cylinders for oxy welding, for repairs, to the, to the machinery, anything that we needed, fuel, all that sort of thing. Fuel was brought in in the drums and uh, also the provisions for the shop that uh, we had to uh, uh, supply the men that worked at the mill with their food. Um, other things was uh, fresh things we used to get sent in by road, but all the other uh, groceries was bought by barge and it was uh, quite a, a big thing when the barge arrived you'd see it, the sails coming round the point there and everyone was ready then for when the unloading started to cart the things to their various places. The, the uh, chaff used to have to go to the stables and, and the uh, oils and that into special sheds that were built for, for the fuel. Yeah, so we would always phone through and let them know what amount of timber he had because they wouldn't just come without being told that there was a load there for them. So when we knew that we had sufficient timber cut and it had been tallied and that, we'd, uh, we'd phone for them to send a barge in. Captain Harry Heather was the captain of the Armadopal. I can't remember it coming into Cockle Creek, although it may have done. Uh, that went into our mill that we had at Moskalin and uh, there was quite some humorous things that happened. Um, if you would like to know about those, you know, when we had a bonfire, if he had any rockets that he wanted to discard, he would come in and, and he was the only one. He used to let them off for us and it caused quite of a bit of uh, sensation when people see those going off. And Clyde Heather was the captain of the May Queen. 
So they were more or less the only ones that I can remember. There was a Mr Pearsall that used to come in here to Cockle Creek on one of the barges. And, uh, but no, they were never, never into the home. They worked till dark of a night loading their boat so they could get back to Hobart, uh, especially you know, if they knew the weather was coming in bad or something like that. When we first came here to Cockle Creek in 1940, there was only the remains of a mill here. Uh, on on the, the concrete blocks here was where the engine was set up and the flywheel that's here was in between those two blocks. Where you're standing is where the boiler was and that was an engine that was bought here at, from Beaconsfield Gold Mines. There was a, a boiler just here from the original mill uh, and that was restored back to safety regulations. My, my father rather, he, um, he retubed it and um, that was past inspection. Then the engine and the flywheel here was brought from Beaconsfield and that was installed on the concrete blocks here. Then the mill was built around it Right, when the uh, mill was completed and uh, the tram lines were put out into the forest, my, uh, there was that was in the South Cape direction. Um, those landings were just about worked out when the war broke out and we had about 28 men working here at that time and um, they were uh, called up, as we said those days. Um, there was uh, only just a couple of uh, people in the area, not married people, with children, uh, and they were, two men was left with Dad to work the mill. One of them went to Matasuka Lighthouse and the other one went to work on the council, for the Espens Council, working on the roads, potholing. So he was only left with his wife and, and the family. So we took on the task of uh, carrying on with the mill. When the landings were, were finished out in the South Cape direction, we decided to go, or Dad went and looked, they call it timber hunting those days, and uh, he went with my brother and they found the timber out in this other direction, going towards Fisher's Point, but back over the, the hill. And uh, we had to put a tram line in, which was quite a big effort. It took us nine months to complete that tram line and then uh, we started, we did select falling and the logs was, we logged it out there when the weather was fine. But when the weather came in bad, rain and so forth, we came into the mill and worked. And it was, was one of the biggest sawmills in Tasmania at that time. And we all had our jobs to do. One of my uh, sisters used to fire the boiler and run the engine under Dad's ticket. He was allowed to do that because he was, uh, had his uh, steam engine's ticket. And uh, my elder brother and I, we cut the logs into certain lengths. When they came in from the bush, they, we got the longest lengths we could. If we had an order for 18 foot timber, will you cut off an 18 foot log or whatever, 20 or what? And then that went in onto a breaking down frame and it was cut in half. Then those two halves went through individually through a Canadian saw, made into flitches, and then from the flitches across to the breast bench where Dad used to head in and my brother George and I used to tail out. And uh, it was quite a, an experience. We uh, could double flitch as well as anyone else. and. Uh, handled the timber quite well. Uh, and then my elder sister, she used to dock the timber into, or dock out the bad pieces, and uh, then that went down the chute, onto the little wagons and out onto the wharf, ready to be taken away on the barges. In uh, the bush when you're falling trees, you've got to have a left-handed and a right-handed person, because back then the trees were fallen with axes and crosscut saws. Now, if the crosscut saw wasn't long enough to reach through where the spurs come down on the trees, you had to go up high enough to get above that. So my brother and I used to put the shoes in, 
and they were niches about that wide and about that deep, chopped into the side of the tree, and then you put a, we called it a shoe, and you put some of the, two on each side, and you made a platform, and that's what you stood on. We used to peel the bark off the side of the, the tree and lay it on so we could stand on it. Um, when you uh, found the tree and you put the scaffolding around it and you went to fall it, you looked at the tree and the area where you wanted to fall it. You didn't fall it into another tree because if you did, you'd probably hang up, uh, end up with a tree lodged and that was dangerous. So you found the best position to fall the tree. The shoe road was in, so you felt it along the angle of the shoe road that, where you were going to take it out. So you decided which way you was going to fall it. Then one person would be on one side for the right-handed. I was left-handed, so I was on the left-handed side. And you chopped the, the, the front in with a, a face, we called it a face, and you determined then the direction that was going to fall. Whichever way you, you lined it up, that's the way it would fall. Yes. Uh, and then you cut the back in with a cross-cut saw. So that was the way of falling the trees back then. There was no chainsaws or... How did you like it? Well, I'd rather work outside than inside and I still use the axe <laughs> in preference to the, the chainsaw. Looking it back... wasn't as dangerous with the axes and... Uh, Cross-cut saws I don't think is what it is today with the chainsaws and bulldozers and things. With, with a, a, an axe, I don't know, you have to have a handle to suit individual people. And if you break your handle in your axe, you go to the shop and you pick out an, a, a handle to suit you. It might have to be shortened, it might, they're all individual, they're like people. You, uh, and hickory handles was always the best, that's what we chose. And uh, we all, each had our own axe. You didn't pick up anyone else's axe and use it because you were responsible for your own axe and your axe was for you and it was your personal thing, so, yeah. Those days it was what we knew and what we were good at and we enjoyed it. And we were a close family and we had Know, good parents and uh, we enjoyed what we were doing. We used to look forward to our uh, trips out of the, the um, creek to go to dances and um, picture shows and that sort of thing but we'd always choose the ones that we wanted to go to. We didn't go to everything and we had a, a Buick motor car that Dad would loan us. George was the driver and we'd all hop in and uh, dress ourselves up to go to a ball or whatever was at Southport or Ramonier or Loon River, whatever was, was going, we were able to go to it. Usually used to get home in the morning when the roosters were crowing <laughs> in the early hours, but that, no, we really enjoyed it. There was never any fights or things like that. Before you even got to Catamaran, the road wasn't really good, but from Catamaran in, Dad had to um, in the wet patches, he had to put uh, poles and they were bound together with a piece fitted in and, and to hold them, to stop them from spreading. And when we'd take our pony, he used to walk up the centre of that. Um, we used to have to go into Catamaran to get our uh, mail and, and bread and our meat. Um, and that was the only way he could do it because otherwise it was too boggy, yeah. And we didn't have any phone here, so we had to go into, we needed an urgent phone call for something. We used to ride the pony into Catamaran to, to make that. So did you have a, 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 a gig as well, or just a pony? Yeah, we had a, a chaise cart, and we always took that when we had to bring um, parcels and things back to the shop. Yeah.